again. Uh, and by the way, we're doing these presentations in three segments. My name is Arthur Bergeron from Mariko Cohen. We're doing these presentations in three segments, kind of as a test to see whether um, uh, using this format is helpful to folks in terms of learning some of the, the important elder law issues that I talk about in my seminars and that I try to supplement when I'm doing these presentations uh, on Bergeron Briefs. So in the, in the in first of these three presentations, we talked about why you might want to trust. Um, and one of the big reasons was always so that I can qualify for mass health. And then in the second presentation, we talked about what it would take to qualify for mass health if you're a single person. And the reason why so many folks who are single will transfer some of their assets into trust uh, if they're worried about ending up in a nursing home is because if they then need to qualify for mass health, um, if those, the assets they own are going to be countable for purposes of qualifying for mass health, unless they've been transferred out of that person's name for at least five years. But in this final segment, I want to talk about the situation that I commonly face when somebody comes in to talk to me because their spouse um, it really needs a lot of care at home a lot, or it needs to be in a nursing home because their spouse has uh, dementia, typically because the spouse has dementia, uh, and therefore needs kind of constant supervision. In this situation, a lot of times, uh, say a husband will come in to me and, and, and say, you know, I've been taking care of my wife for, for you know, several years. She's getting worse and worse. I just can't do it anymore. Um, and I often tell that husband, you know, the one thing you don't want to do for your wife is drop dead because if your wife, your wife needs you and your wife needs you as the husband, doesn't need you as the nurse, doesn't need you as the cook, really needs you as the husband, especially as um, your wife is having more severe dementia symptoms because the one person that she is the most least likely to forget is you, right? So in that situation, a husband will come in to me and say, well, what, what can we do? We have all these assets. Um, and the answer to that is, typically, everything is fine. So say, for example, that this husband has come in to me saying his wife needs to be in a nursing home, that they own a home, say the home is worth $300,000. Say they have other assets worth another $400,000. And there are a whole bunch of things. There's Maybe he has an IRA, maybe there is an annuity, maybe there's probably some cash in the bank or some CDs. So in that situation, what can um, uh, this person do to, to make sure that his wife, if she needs nursing home care, can qualify for Mass Health? And by the way, the reason why, of course, he wants her to qualify for Mass Health is because if she goes to a nursing home, uh, if she's there, um, uh, unless she got discharged from a hospital directly to the nursing home, and even then, if she's there for more than 100 days, Medicare is not going to cover that remaining nursing home stay. Medicare, which is health insurance, like all health insurance, covers the cost of getting better, not the cost of staying the same. So after that period, um, uh, his wife is going to be on either paying privately at a rate of probably about $12,000 a month, uh, uh, or is going to try to get on Mass Health, the Massachusetts name for the Medicaid program. Now, in this situation, um, this person's wife, and I'm going to call the people Frank and Mary. These are the couple that I so often use when I'm doing my presentations here in Ashland. Um, if Frank wants Mary to qualify for Mass Health, and they've got those assets, Mary cannot have more than $2,000 in countable assets if she's going to qu uh, 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 qualify for Mass Health. Frank, on the other hand, the spouse at home, the, the healthy spouse, can own the home itself, no matter what the equity value, uh, can have other cash or cash equivalent assets up to uh, $123,600, and most importantly, can have unlimited income, unlimited income. Therefore, what I would recommend to Frank uh, in that situation is that first, he transfer all of his assets uh, from Mary to him. Any of the assets that were held jointly be transferred to him individually. Now, for him to be able to do that, especially um, if Mary is a joint owner on the house, which typically she would be, or if she owns any individual assets in her own name, he's going to need a power of attorney from Mary, a document from Mary saying 
that he has the ability on her behalf to sign things so that he can on her behalf, for example, sign the deed, transferring the house from the two of them to just him, or sign, any, sign over any bank accounts. So a, it is crucial to spouses ahead of time that they make sure that they have done powers of attorney, typically naming each other uh, as the attorney so that if one of them is incapacitated, the other one can sign documents on their behalf. But assuming that Frank and Mary had done that, my recommendation to Frank would be have all the assets, Frank, transferred to you, right? At this point, that point, therefore, he would own the house, but the house would be non-countable in the event that Mary needed to qualify for mass health. He then has um, uh, too much money um, because, as I had mentioned, uh, he can only have a little over $120,000 in other cash or cash equivalent assets. However, Frank has the ability to have unlimited income. Therefore, what Frank can do with the extra money, the amount, let's say, over $100,000, is he can use that money to purchase an annuity. As long as that annuity calls for equal monthly payments over a term that does not exceed Frank's actuarial life expectancy, that's a, that's a long sentence, equal monthly payments over a term that does not exceed Frank's actuarial life expectancy, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. Because what it, all that an annuity is is basically a contract that you make with an insurance company. What you agree to do is you agree to pay the insurance company a bunch of money. In return for that, the insurance company agrees to pay you back so much per month, in this case, over a term. Um, how long would Frank's actuarial life expectancy be? Well, for example, if Fr Frank were 89 years old and we're doing this transaction, his life expectancy would be about five years. And by the way, there is, it, to figure out the actuarial life expectancy, you need to, to base it on a table that is used by MassHealth. When you talk to the insurance companies and they tell you what your life expectancy is, that's just for their purposes. In order to comply with this regulation, you need to make sure you're complying with the Mass Health chart. According to the Mass Health chart, if I recall correctly, if Frank were 89 years old, his life expectancy would be about five years. Um, one of the so pr Frank would literally take the $400,000 in other cash or cash equivalent assets, keep 100, take the other $300,000, and use the 300,000 to buy an annuity as long as the annuity called for equal monthly payments over a term um, that was shorter than his life expectancy, the day after he purchased that annuity, Mary could qualify for mass health. The house would be safe. The cash that Frank had would be safe. There is one caveat. According to a fairly recent change in mass health regulations, a change that took effect in 2017, uh, if Frank purchased that annuity, Mary went on MassHealth, and MassHealth started paying for Mary's care at a nursing home. And if Frank subsequently died before he had received all of the annuity payments back, MassHealth would have a lien. MassHealth would now have a lien on those remaining annuity payments to get repaid for the care that they had provided to Mary. Uh, as long as all of the payments had already come back to Frank before he died, there would be no mass health lien. Therefore, Frank has some incentive to make the, the, the annuity term be as short as possible. Remember, I mentioned earlier that the, the term that is involved has to be shorter than Frank's actuarial life expectancy. It can be much shorter than that. It just can't be longer than his actuarial life expectancy. Now, until very recently, until this year, um, this mechanism, the purchase of an annuity, was a real problem for older folks because as a, as a commercial matter, you could not find a company that would sell an annuity with a life expectancy that was shorter than four or five years here in Massachusetts. Uh, I did become aware, though, recently uh, that there is, there is now a, 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 a company that, that sells annuities for terms that are shorter than four years. Uh, therefore, this, this device is available for folks of all ages, even though, um, um, even, if, even for people who have a life expectancy of shorter than four years, 
and it's available for people who really want to try to compress these payments coming back so as to avoid the mass health lien. So to summarize, for folks who come, and this goes back to the, the first of these three presentations, for folks who come in to me saying, don't I really need a trust because I want to protect my assets from, assets from mass health? Well, my response typically, if they're married, is no, you don't. You can keep all of your assets in your own names because later on, if one of you needs to qualify for mass health, at that point, you can simply shift all of the assets to the other spouse and have that other spouse turn around and buy an annuity. I hope this and the previous two segments were helpful, and thanks very much for joining me on the show.